afternoon. Um, welcome to today's session, uh, New Horizons Ahead, Trends and Developments in Tomorrow's Design. I would like to welcome our panelists. Uh, we'll start with Tony Mickey from uh, Fosters and Partner. Anna Lobo Martin, Director of Interior Design at Arc uh, International Design. Thank you. Eliza Falzen, VP Architecture, Design and Construction at MENA Region for Hilton. And finally, uh, Nuni Anand, the co founder of Viva Hotels. Um, in hospitality, design is more than just aesthetics. It is about creating experiences, integrating technology, sustainability, and culture um, in the shape of future of uh, luxury destinations. Today, um, we are joined by three leading, four leading experts, sorry, uh, who will be sharing their insights on how these trends are transforming industry. Um, I would like to start with you, Tony, and um, we ha a lot of things we've discussed, um, people talk about luxury and what it means to them, and I think it evolved over the years. And uh, uh, Foster and Partners are renowned for their iconic projects. What are some of the key design trends you see, and what does the, the term luxury um, mean to you right now? So when it comes to luxury, luxury is is a big word. I think we can't, it's very hard to define luxury in a spatial, in a physical way is what we believe. And I think as an architect, our sort of goal is always to provide luxury that's not visible, something that is very intuitive, something that you feel. And we think that, um, a luxurious service is something that is very intuitive. It's something that you don't ask for. And in that sort of sense, architecture needs to be the same. You know, you know you're know, you served um, where you're not in the unconscious. It's, it's there subconsciously, basically. And I think trying to sort of talk about that, it, it could, we could talk hours about it, but I think in a nutshell, I think um, luxury is about providing you know, the needs for the people and serving the people that are using the building um, in a way that is not so bling bling, in a way that is, you know, naturally sort of uh, done. Thank you. Anna, um, you've worked on very iconic uh, hospitality projects uh, around the world, but also in the region. And from an interior design uh, point of view, there was a time where it was all about opulence and Without marble like countertops, yes. all of that. Yeah. But that has changed as uh, travelers are becoming more sophisticated, more exactly. well traveled. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean to you nowadays? Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of interior design, and Tony touched upon something very important, which is, of course, about the quality of service and the amenities and mm -hmm. the invisible aspect of all of that. Mm -hmm. But um, there is also uh, the essence of the place and the DNA of where we are and the culture of where we are, etc., and how this can be seamlessly stitched into the experience. So, um, luxury is about all those things. In interior design, for example, at least me as designer, I try to stitch in these things when thinking about materials, when thinking about uh, patterns, when thinking about you know, the stitching of a particular chair. How does that relate to where I am and what I am doing? And I think it is the quality of all of these things coming together that really gives you a luxurious experience. And um, a, a final thing I'd like to mention, because I mentioned materials, and this has a lot to do with architecture, is about the timeless quality of everything, right? I think us as designers, we have this responsibility about creating timeless uh, spaces and experiences that will last through time, um, and in a way also become more sustainable and for, our, um, for the future to come. Thank you. Um, 
uh, Eliza, Hilton has been the forefront of luxury with uh, numerous amount of projects and you kind of work from the operator's point of uh, view, but you look at from architecture to interior and so on. How does that uh, come, come uh, into place at the moment? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So as I reflect on the luxury segment across Middle East and Africa, it's going from strength to strength. And as if we look at what Hilton has been doing in the space over the past few years, we've been able to consistently deliver two or three luxury hotel openings every year. And this year has been no exception. So if I reflect on the year, we welcome the world of Astoria Seychelles, our first world of Astoria in this beautiful destination. And for those of you who know how beautiful the Indian Ocean is, the landscape is absolutely breathtaking. Absolutely. So what we did with our owners and our project teams is to work very closely with the consultant team to first and foremost understand the context. This beautiful island which had so much rich fauna and flora that we use that as an inspiration for the design. And it, together with the architects and the interior designers, we brought that to life through the architecture, interior design, and all the way through to the service. So to go back to your original question, what is luxury? It's a very difficult question, but if I had to try to sum it up, it's probably the, the sum of all parts delivered to the highest quality within its context. So Tony touched on the architecture. The built environment is critical in the luxury landscape to make sure you are delivering, delivering a best-in-class product coupled with the interior design. And then if we achieve those two pillars, that beautiful asset becomes a wonderful vehicle for our team members to then continue narrating that powerful and very compelling story to our guests because ultimately I think the success of any luxury project is having all those of those various components delivered to the highest standard to make sure that our guests can actually understand and savor that beautiful story. Thank you. Noni, sometimes uh, people confuse luxury with only five-star hotels, but luxury um, means different things uh, to different people. And you're operating uh, mid-range uh, hotels, you're very considerably new to the market, maybe just in the last uh, four years. Six and years. Six years. Yes. And expanding. What does that luxury mean for you at, the, at your asset? Um, I would say I, I, as a designer and as an operator, I have the honor and the privilege to, to look at both sides. Uh, but if I look at it specifically from a design perspective, I would say for me, um, as an operator as well as a designer, um, luxury to me is about creating an experience. Um, it's about the feeling that I want my guests to have when they're in that space, whether that is through the fabrics I'm selecting, whether that is through um, choosing to go conscious design, whether that is choosing to um, elevate the look and feel of a certain space, whether that is about the sense of smell, whether that is about, th there are many, many elements that tie into, that tie into luxury and mean different things for different people. However, luxury can also be done on a budget. It just depends on how, yeah. on how you choose to apply it. And at the end of the day, um, we are opening our first five star. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it will be hopefully mid next year, 2025. That's what the contractors say, we all know. We all know how that goes. Um, but yeah, and, I th and our tagline uh, is, so, is so appropriately tied into the term luxury where we say it's about elevating senses. So I believe for me personally, luxury is not something that you should just see, but it should be something that you can feel. That's what I believe. That's, that's a good one. Thank you. It's a feeling, not just mm -hmm. what you can see. Um, I'm going to go to you, Anna. And your work focuses a lot um, on integrating local culture um, uh, and context on global hospitality. How, how do you approach that when you're starting a new project? Well, uh, I think the best example to talk about that is uh, when I had to do this uh, a hotel, uh, the Savani Hotel next to Khazar al Sarab in Abu Dhabi. For those of you who know it, it's, it's a fabulous hotel. Mm -hmm. And the client insisted that we spend a week there before designing anything, just to understand the spirit of place. And I'll never forget those first few nights in the desert when you couldn't hear a thing and how the, the sun came up or went down. And that's an experience on its own. And so I think, now coming back to design, 
uh, it's about how we incorporate all of those things into what we are offering and also about um, this complete experience that we want to create. So I was talking earlier about, you know, patterns or fabrics or whatever, but it's this combined experience, also a little bit as, as uh, Eliza was also saying, where everything comes together, the, the parts uh, come together, that give it that uh, very interesting, interesting feel. Me as a designer, I think I'm very privileged because I'm in the, let's say, the, the final end of the chain. So it's where the guest will sit. It's the, you know, the curtains they will draw and the, what they will see. So I think that's um, an amazing role to have and to portray all these things uh, in, in, in the experience. Okay. Um, what about from an architecture point of view? How how early do you start thinking of sustainability and how do you approach it? And I know it differs from one project to another, but what is the train thought that? I think you know, from, from our point of view, the sustainability is such a big word, right? But I think as, uh, you know, from an architect's point of view, our responsibility is to make sure that we're creating a building that's not reliant on technology. So we call that um, passive architecture. Mm -hmm. So in every site, every location we design, it's very different because the climate is different, because the site is different. Now, when we do passive um, architecture, we do look into the vernacular architecture as well, in terms of how did they used to build before technology was there? So you think about for example, the Maldives, um, where we're heavily involved with in the Gafaru project. We start by understanding what's there, what's on the land, how did they used to live without that type of technology, and try to find various passive ways to mitigate the use of energy and you know technology to cool the place, etc. So by doing that, we're sort of, you know, completely reducing the amount and the dependence on energy as much as possible. So I think as a responsible architect, I think that's the things that we need to do, understand the climate, understand how they used to do it, and see how we can adapt that in a modern way. Thank you. Um, and do you see from, from that point of view, how does the culture and the, uh, the, the context of that, that's part of sustainability, but it's, does it come into the material and, and, and the, the community yes. and so on? Exactly. And one of the debates that we're having with um, the team in the Maldives is how do we try to source local material as much as possible? Mm -hmm. In a place where, you know, they're dependent in a lot of the sort of imports right. and cost goes up because of that, how do we start to think of local materials that we can start growing within the Maldives? So we're looking at timber. For example, how do we use um, the palm, for example, to, to create building material? But that comes back to sort of culture and authenticity as well, where we're trying to use material of the land, of the place, and develop the craftsmen that used to make those things before all of this sort of modern building technology kicked in. So it's trying to sort of learn from the past and also trying to sort of adapt new building technologies into those techniques, which also at the same time brings out the culture as well as authenticity and, a, and an architecture for the place, right? So those are the kind of things that we'd like to start with when we, when we approach design. Um, Eliza, I want Hilton um, as a group has a very strong DNA and brand that we've known for decades. Um, how do you keep that, but also um, respect and integrate context and culture when you're developing a new project? So I think we, our approach is probably very similar to yours, Tony. When we kick off any new project, especially when we're talking about lifestyle and luxury segment, where authenticity and bespoke design really come to the forefront of any project, 
what we invite our owners and our project teams to do is to understand two things. First of all, to understand the owner's vision, especially if it's a private developer. They have their dreams, they have their aspirations, and it's our responsibility to understand that in order to deliver that in the physical built environment. And then the second thing we invite all our project teams to do is, as you alluded to earlier, Anna, is to understand the context. It's not good enough to understand the regional landscape or the country level landscape, but we really need to understand the, the, the site context, to understand what is happening in the neighborhood, be it flora, fauna, gastronomy, culture, skills and workmanship that is available to really appreciate the local culture and perhaps allow the interior designers and the architects the time and the luxury to really use that as an inspiration for the concept exactly. design. Because the minute you are able to marry the two, the owner's vision and a really deep and authentic understanding of that concept, concept it becomes a beautiful foundation for us to build on, metaphorically speaking, of course, <laughs> the architecture <laughs> and the interior design. Yes. And <laughs> if that is delivered to the highest standards, to the best quality, Again, I, a point I alluded to earlier, our hotel teams are then able to really com deliver and have a, a very compelling storytelling exercise with our, with our guests. And we've, we've done this actually, I think um, the panelists prior to us mentioned Diria Gate. We're yes. working, we have the privilege of working with them on two beautiful properties, the Ward of Astoria, Diria Gate, which is on top of the escarpment in the middle of the urban setting, but we also have an Alexa Wadi Hanifa, which is sitting in the in the date in the in the palm palm grove so there are hundreds if not thousands of palm trees which have been living you know have been grown there and harvested there for hundreds of years so what the rear gates are doing are painstakingly mapping each one of those palm trees to make sure that they are treated with respect and that they are preserved and then the architects and designers are are mandated to to design around those beautiful um, that beautiful farm and it became a beautiful story that is being translated as we speak through to the interior design and we expect that at an operational level to be really then um, translated down to all the facilities and amenities whether it's FMB offering, leisure facilities, wellness facilities and so forth. So it's what, what is key is probably doing that with authenticity so that it becomes a respectful, uh, you know, respectful gesture towards the culture that is accommodating that hotel and becomes authentic and timeless like we were discussing yes, earlier. Exactly. And, and Eliza, I think it's also very relevant what you said earlier about uh, that your staff becomes storytellers. Yes, or yes right? storytellers, absolutely. That they can convey that message and make the experience yeah. more complete. Yeah, because what is the point of designing beautiful hotels, you know, architecture which is respectful and interior design which really delivers the highest standards if our guests aren't able to understand that exactly. through their journey as yeah. they stay with us. Exactly, yeah. It all goes back to storytelling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, Noni, you've, uh, you, for, uh, for such a young brand, you started in Dubai, you're already in Jeddah and Nigeria. How does that culture, the difference from urban settings to one country and different continents at the moment, and you have nine assets coming uh, in the next few years. How does culture and context affect how you design each of your properties? Um, I would say in a, in a very big way, um, because this is a brand um, and a company that we have started on our own from scratch, um, we are very, very invested in this. Um, one of our pillars we have, which is art, design, and our people, which is what I call our culture. Um, we do a lot of art and design locally. Um, just like Anna was saying, you know, your selection of fabrics in terms of sustainability, things like that. Um, we, work, we work within parameters that we know that, 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 the, um, that the guests will appreciate. Um, and this will, this will be something that can be enjoyed by all ages and all cultures because just as you said, Rosa, the ethnicities the world over are all different. Everyone thinks differently. But the beauty is in when the brand can actually marry the brand values and keep in mind also the guests who are actually going to be walking through those doors, paying customers, and be able to give them that experience that, that, that makes them feel like you know, they belong. You know, it'd be too cliche of me to use the term home away from home because I'm sure <laughs> that's been done and dusted a million times over. 
But at the end of the day, I believe um, culture and heritage play a very big role because I think they determine and they dictate in a very large way the design trends that are going to follow in the years to come because people's minds are constantly changing. The average traveler no longer is someone who is middle-aged or older. We have a lot of young people who are traveling today who form opinions, who use social yes. media. And it makes, it makes it all the more reason why as, as brands across the board in the world, we need to kind of stand for something, but at the same time, in some way, kind of hand in hand speak the same language, so that all of our guests the world over feel that they are inclusive and they are part of the experience that they are whether in town for a day for, a week for, a month for, because guests come and stay, uh, you know, as, as a guest and hopefully leave as family. So that's, that's something that we try to work towards tirelessly. Yes. Yeah. We cannot talk about trends uh, without mentioning technology. <laughs> That's up. So, um, it's been, uh, it revolutionizes um, architecture, uh, design. How does your firm approach it in such projects, especially in locations where, like as you mentioned, the Maldives or somewhere else that isn't? Well, yeah. uh, from our point of view, I think technology doesn't dictate design. Right. I think technology is there to to serve what we need it for. Right. It's a tool mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I think um, you know there's different levels of services, especially from the um, operation side. There are different needs that a property would need. And I think for us, it's about complementing those services with technology. But on the other hand, there is useful technology that we tend to put into a lot of our buildings, which is uh, simple technology like sensors, let's say. And th there's lots of things we can talk about, but sensors are very important because it tells you how the building is being used mm -hmm. and being able to sort of see where there are any inefficiencies within the building so that we can actually tune the sort of technology to adapt to how the building is actually being used. During the design phases, we are always sort of assuming how the building is going to be used. But as you know, the operators come in, as the, you know, the customers come in, it's actually possibly used in a different way. So we want to make our building as adaptable as possible. So using things like sensors and monitors a lot, for example, is what we do so that there's a post-occupancy evaluation that we can do and the operators can also tune the building to suit the needs for 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 the build for for the customers. So it's really about sustainability as well, right? Monitoring the life of the that. building. Correct. Exactly. I think that's fantastic because you know we're talking about trends and sustainability, but Hilton's very passionate about sustainability, and we started our we founded our global ESG platform in 2011. So long before sustainability became a trend. The and we developed our own proprietary software called Lightstay, which allows us to monitor all utilities across more than 7,000 properties globally. So to your point, Amazing. Tony, we're able yeah. to harness a lot of data, which can be you know, used at different levels. At a hotel level, our engineering team are able to immediately monitor and adjust utilities on, on site to make sure utilities are performing at the best and bills are exactly. lower. At a regional and a global level, we're able to harness that data and then manage it, and more importantly, track and report to our stakeholders very clearly and transparently. So, you know, collecting data is extremely important for us. Um, but it's also, I think, our responsibility as a project team to be having those conversations with owners which are data-driven and very compelling as to why they should be investing a little bit more at the capex spend at, throughout the design and construction so that they understand the value of that additional spend. And there are many arguments that we can be presenting to our ownership groups. It could be, you know, Hilton has collected a lot of data and we know from our customers, from our guests, that guests want products, hotel and resorts, which are more sustainable. So there's an argument to be had about additional demand being generated by sustainable hotels. There's an argument to be had around lower utility bills. And obviously there's one which we've seen in more mature markets where hotels which are designed and built to high standards are valued at a premium. So exactly. whilst it is our responsibility to be doing, you know, to be delivering sustainable design, it's a moral imperative, we also need to be arguing the case with our owners to make them understand why commercially it is an appealing case. 
And I think as Hilton's architecture, design and construction team, we're really well placed to give owners this advice and we Absolutely. leverage obviously consultants like yourselves to be able to have those conversations with our owners. Sustainability is a bad word, I think. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's got to be <laughs> common sense. I mean, why is it a word, right? <laughs> it's got to be common sense. It that's should. that's the thing that keeps bugging us. And I think throughout history, no one needed to talk about sustainability because that was how things, and I, it's only yes, the last exactly. hundreds of years exactly. that we have uh, diverted from yes. that, and now I think we're going back and we're using it until it becomes uh, a non-issue. Yeah. But I think also in interior design, um, how do you do it? How do you approach sustainability? Uh, um, technology. technology. Yes. Okay. Um, so technology, uh, we can't avoid it. So it's everywhere. Uh, everyday new things. And I think um, apart from those, you know, tech uh, aspects that should become as seamless as possible, like, you know, the controls in your room, how you operate that. We all know, I think, the difficulty about how do we turn on the specific light or turn them all uh, out or how do we control the temperature in the bathroom. So, I mean, those are all sort Eight of technical points. aspects that uh, we've all suffered in a way or another and that need to be seamlessly integrated and make our lives easier. And this turns around back to luxury, which is something that we were talking about and this having comfort without needing to ask someone about it. Um, but technology, I think, for example, also got very much enhanced and in hospitality as well because of COVID. You know, not needing to touch things in order to have service, you know, self-check-in, self-check-out, all of that. But there's also an interesting thing, and this touches on new generations that are very, you know, on social, social networks and very tech-savvy. That has to do with the way that we integrate experiences into the hotel and art and things like that. Because new generations are also looking for Instagrammable places. So I think the way that we integrate all of this on the first hand into interior design, because it's not an add-on, it needs to be part of the experience, but also how, you know, even working with artists and how interactive things can become and how these experiences can come through using technology is really cutting edge. And, you know, people are looking for these things and they want to be wowed. So uh, I think there's a great market to this, and, you know, and uh, AI is for sure, you know, dealing cards, even the opening conference today was talking about AI and they had an AI on stage and it was unbelievable. So I think for the coming years, we need to look out and really all of us together that are designing these things, um, incorporate them. So good things to come. <laughs> Noni, uh, yes. you mentioned that um, your brand, the DNA is technology, mm -hmm. design and art. Mm -hmm. What does technology in, in your brand, how does it show up and what does it mean to you? Well, six years ago when we decided to start the brand, um, we knew then, as everyone knows now and as everyone has known since time immemorial, that technology is not really a topic that anyone can avoid anymore. Um, whether that is, just like Anna was saying, making the experience as seamless as possible for the guest, giving them as many um, experiences, be it with your check-in, be it with access to facilities, amenities inside the hotel, externally outside the hotel. Um, it all depends on, at the same time, what the budgets allow for every property that you're working with. So there, there are um, a lot of hotels um, that offer different services, a multitude of services available to the guest. Um, but I think at the same, on the same token, I would have to say today's guest, no matter what age, is very savvy, very, very tech savvy. They take the responsibility themselves to take control of what they want to see, what they want to do, what they want to hear, how they want to feel. And I think that in a very big way for us as a brand elevates the experience where we, fe we don't feel the pressure, I would say, in having to deliver necessarily. But on the same token, we try and make available as much as we can from a brand perspective. Um, that the guest would feel like they have enough of an engagement on that particular segment for us. Um, having said that, I would have to say technology does make your life easier. No one can deny uh, on many levels. But at the end of the day, I believe um, the warmth of a smile is not something that technology can ever replace. That is what I believe. At the end of the day, for me, it, it comes back to people, even though we have all of these different parallels and parameters that we talk about. It's the business of hospitality. It's the, the business end. of hospitality. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes
yeah. I think that's a great <laughs> note to end our um, panel today. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for enduring us at the end of the day for the last <laughs> session. And thanks for sharing your invaluable insight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank you. Um, are we open to any questions with the audience? Audience, any questions uh, before we close? Okay, perfect. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, a panel I was on earlier was. Uh, I don't. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the p the panel a panel I was on earlier there was somebody talking about our assumptions on what a hotel is. They were talking about innovation and, and, and how we, you know, so many people, when you think about a hotel, you close your eyes and you think about, I drove up, I get out the valet, I go in a, you know, vertical building, a horizontal building, and, and there's a reception and there's a whole process of a, of a pre-designed concept of what we have as a hotel. When, when you're thinking from an architecture perspective, from a design perspective, and, and kind of taking that to the next step, how do you see that potentially evolving outside of perhaps those traditional stereotypes of what a hotel is? It's to all of us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, actually, I, there's something I think very interesting about what you said that touches upon something very current that has to do with the flexibility of space. And um, I think the way, not only hospitality, but a lot of the life of a building is evolving is more and more the ability to be flexible and adapt to different needs. So when you go to a hotel, traditionally you had a lobby, a restaurant, a room. But more and more, your room is your workplace sometimes. A lobby needs to be turned into an event or a concert or even to work in. And so I think these predefined assumptions about spaces are getting very, very diluted. It's like in a shopping center. Today you find clinics, even museums like in the Dubai Mall. I mean, more and more things start to be a little bit blended. You have hotels in airports and in shopping mm -hmm. centers as well. So I think all of this is sort of working together. Um, in the end, it's really about the experience, right? And about making you feel welcomed and it's sometimes wowed. But I think those boundaries are really being tested today. And it, again, it will be very interesting to see how, how they evolve in the long run. Thank you, Jury, uh, for the answer. I would just take a last question, a quick question, and then we will end the session. I have a uh Hi. Um, so I'm picking up of what Tony said, but it's to the rest of the panel. Um, when talking about using the local um, supply in the market when in for materials into the build, in some of the locations, there's not enough demand for suppliers to to produce, right, uh, in a way that makes it cost effective or is there a way that, you know, as the tourism industry grows in a certain market, we're able to encourage in that sort of industry to, to make the cost of build ch cheaper? I mean, for Africa especially, uh, the cost of build is so much higher because you're importing a lot, but they have access to a lot of the raw materials. It's just manufacturers just haven't had the supply. How can designers and uh, architects work together to do that? I think um, it's not only the architects and the designers, but it's also the government. Um, and that's where, you know, and working closely with MFMC is, is great in the Maldives because it's a tie up between the two sides. Um, there's a lot of incentives that could be given, I think. So if we are able to provide the raw materials from um, the government side, let's say, um, where there are separate initiatives to grow um, timber. Um, and instead of importing the material, you import skilled labor to actually teach how you sort of process that timber into lumber, right? Into, into timber that could be used for construction. And, and that's why I think it's an integrated process. I think it's something that um, all parties, all stakeholders need to get together um, to work hand in hand to find that sort of circular economy that can work within the nation or within um, the region to help stimulate that kind of growth. I think the days of, you know, sending timber from Norway or Sweden all the way down to Africa or to Saudi, I think those days are gone. I think we do need to look at ways 
of creating that material that you can build in there in in that in that region or find alternative materials that is suitable for that location uh, on this panel thanks a lot we will end the session now um, just the last remark I would say these sessions were pretty interesting today thanks for the valuable insights uh, I would let you uh, go back and have a <laughs> relaxed bit.